This program is brought to you by NewsWorks in cooperation with Eau Claire County. This program is simulcast on WRFPLP 101.5. Capital was raised, three dozen bands were signed on, vending and concession, concession licensing secured, and stage and sound engineers hired. On the morning of April 24, 1970, Peter looked on at all the sheriff deputies stationed just off the York property, wondering if anyone was going to show up. And by noon that first day, people showed up in droves. Tickets were $7 for one day and $15 for the weekend. The place was huge, the perimeter was huge, and there wasn't foresight to secure the grounds. About 30,000 people attended Sound Storm, the majority sneaking in through the woods without paying. <laughs> the Columbia County Sheriff, seeing his officers outnumbered, wisely decided to ignore the misdemeanors. He told the county board he did have a backup plan should there be trouble that included a highway department truck filled with automatic rifles and tear gas and canisters. When undercover officers infiltrated the crowd, Peter dropped 10,000 flyers from a helicopter with the message, they come in peace. In the end, the police made no arrest and the sheriff told the press both the promoters and the fans have been very cooperative. With vendors and ticket sales, Peter believes the festival brought in about $170,000 in cash. It's still not verified, but rumored that while the Grateful Dead were playing, someone stole $100,000 kept backstage in a suitcase. Though he was broke, Obradovich walked away with a career as a promoter, even bringing Bob Hope to Wisconsin for a show. And Soundstorm is still its official company name. The Rock Festival was the first of its kind in Wisconsin, and about the third in the United States after Woodstock. You can read lots more details and a gallery of photos at wisconsinhistory.org. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Gavin. The next item on our agenda is a roll call. Supervisors, please take your keypads in hand and indicate your presence. Supervisor Anton and Supervisor Mortz. Supervisor Henning. Supervisor Russell. I think that's there we, everyone. There we go. Yep. Thank you. The next item on our agenda is approval of the Journal of Proceedings, which we do by voice vote. Motion, please. Motion by Supervisor Leary, second by Supervisor Deming. This is not a debatable item. Uh, are there any additions, corrections, or deletions? Sorry, just spoke against myself there. <laughs> <laughs> any additions, corrections, or deletions? Seeing none. Uh, all those in favor of approval of the agenda indicate by saying aye. Aye. Thank you. Uh, this is the time at which you indicate some small changes in the agenda that you just approved. So if you will take your agendas in hand, you will note under item number eight, first reading of the ordinances, files 15, 29, and 30, the block of three under Committee on Planning and Development. Those are actually going to the end of our agenda and we will be voting on those in this session. Secondly, in, under item 10, file uh, 39, we are moving up to right after file 19 and before file 25 because the file 39 is relevant to file 25. And I think those are the only changes. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, did you want to mention that change that you wanted to make? No, just when I'm doing it. All right. Thank you. Uh, the next item on our agenda is. Uh, the happy duty of confirming the appointment of uh, Nathan Anderson to fill the County Board Supervisor District 20 seat. Uh, I, I've made the appointment, but the, the board must confirm it. So I look for a motion to confirm Mr. Anderson. Motion by Supervisor Buchanan, second by Supervisor Boardwoman. Uh, all those in favor of the confirmation, please indicate by saying aye. 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 I think you can do that by voice. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
Okay, uh, and all those opposed by nay, it is unanimous. Thank you very much. The county clerk will now administer the oath and I will ask Mr. Anderson to come forward. Nathan, I need you to raise your right hand, please. Mm -hmm. I state your name. I am Nathan Anderson. Having been appointed to the office of Eau Claire County Supervisor in District 20. Having been appointed to the office of, uh, oh my God. Oh, Eau Claire <laughs> County <laughs> Supervisor in District 20. Uh, swear that you will support the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of Wisconsin. Swear that I will support the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of Wisconsin. And will faithfully and impartially discharge the duties of your said office to the best of your ability. And will faithfully and impartially discharge the duties of said office to the best of my ability. So help you God. So help me God. That's okay. It is now official, there's no turning back. <laughs> <laughs> Supervisor Lavelle will be happy to indicate your seat. Thank you, <laughs> as I know you will. The next item on our agenda is confirmation of the appointment of Norbert or Norb Kirk uh, as finance director. I uh, look for a motion from Supervisor uh, Bates and a second from Supervisor Henning. Uh, again, this is a confirmation, it's not a debatable motion. Um, all those in favor of the confirmation indicate by saying aye. Aye. Opposed by nay. Thank you, it is unanimous. Do we, do we, we don't do any swearing in, right? No. Okay. Uh, Mr. Kirk, would you stand so we can all recognize you? <laughs> and congratulations. There's a very sharp learning curve there. <laughs> okay. Uh, the next item on our agenda is public comment. Uh, just a reminder to you, uh, we have a public comment period of no longer than half an hour. Each person has three minutes to make comment. This is not a question and discussion period. It's an opportunity for the public to offer thoughts, comments, and their own discussion about particular points. I will take these in order of uh, the, uh, the sign up, and I will indicate also the topic or issue each person uh, intends to address. Uh, first on the list is Eleanor Wolf, who will be addressing the issue of the County Forest ATV trails. Uh, I will ask. Uh, Christopher Grimm to be standing in line prepared to uh, speak next. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, my name is Eleanor Wolf, and I live at 1810 Birch Street in Eau Claire. Uh, it's been brought to my attention that uh, there are going to be some uh, ATV trails that are going to be turned into um, multiple use trails, uh, which would allow for trucks to come in on the uh, ATV trail, and I'm opposed to that uh, for these reasons. Uh, it doesn't make any sense to make any more uh, county roads, and this would be more or less a county road, uh, when we can't afford to keep uh, maintaining those roads that we have. And the heavier uh, vehicles, the trucks on those trails would cause ruts and uh, would have to be uh, 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 maintained and um, would take more uh, money to maintain them. The other thing is that what I've seen happen in the county forest, and I've witnessed this myself, I mean I've not witnessed the, uh, the actual incident, but uh, uh, I can see those trucks uh, hauling in the old couches and the chairs and the TVs and the refrigerators and dumping them in the county forest. County forests are a good dumping ground and uh, it would be hard to haul a big couch in on an ATV, but you could on in a truck. So for those reasons and also for safety reasons, I'm opposed to uh, making any uh, ATV trails into truck, vehicle, uh, car, uh, other kinds of uh, uh, vehicle trails. So uh, that's my position. Thank you. Oh, no. Thank you. 
Uh, Mr. Uh, Grimm, Christopher Grimm, and next on deck will be Patty Scott. Hi, my name is Christopher Grimm. I'm uh, not for the closure of the trail that they have in Eau Claire County Forest. Uh, for reasons being, my family and other families in the community or in the area use the forest lands and the trails that have been open longer than I've been alive for bear hunting, berry picking, fishing, just about anything you can do out in the outdoors. You close, if some of them trails get closed, there won't be, uh, you'll be closing off hundreds of acres of county forest from being able to be used besides for ATVs. Them trails have been there longer than an ATV has been around. Uh, and, okay. Thank you. Uh, next up is Patty Scott addressing the climate resolution. Following her would be Mary Jackson. Hi, I'm Patty Scott. Um, I live in Eau Claire. I'm a member of Citizens Climate Lobby and I'm here to support the climate resolution. First, I'd like to identify some key anchor points for any discussion of climate. Others will fill in some of the details of the proposal after me. The basic facts are not in dispute. Climate change is real, we've caused it, it's serious, and prompt action is needed. More than half of all Americans agree with that and are worried about our future. So we need to help amplify those voices to elevate climate action as a national priority. The primary driver of climate change is rising levels of greenhouse gases caused by burning fossil fuels. Any effective solution has to match the scale of the problem and shift us from carbon fuels to renewable energy. And by the way, if you saw Sunday's op-ed about CO2 being good for us, the author is cherry-picking uh, facts, taking them out of context to reach erroneous conclusions, and he and the scientists that he cites are climate deniers with uh, connections to the same organization that spent lots of time trying to convince you that smoking is not hazardous to your health. So finally, we're currently uh, hampered by the absence of climate leadership in Washington, where climate discussion is being suppressed. So what does all that have to do with the county and with this resolution? Well, climate impacts affecting us here in Wisconsin have the potential to touch many areas of county responsibility, including emergency management, highways, groundwater, public health, parks and forests, planning, and budget. We're most at risk from extreme rain events, higher temperatures, and insect-borne diseases, and should be, be prepared for more things like flooding and washouts, like they've seen up north this weekend, mudslides, groundwater contamination, heat-related illnesses, power outages in heat spells that poses a danger to many with their health, shortened lifespan of our roads from high heat and more freeze and thaw cycles, and more ticks, and more of them carrying more diseases. These impacts fall under the county umbrella and will require local people, local resources, and local money to address. So I think it's in your interest to support this resolution that urges a national market-based carbon fee and dividend legislation. It's a plan robust enough to help us slow and reverse course, which will help rein in the severity of our local climate impacts. I believe that if we could do only one thing to address global warming, this is the solution that would make the biggest difference. I also believe that your voice matters, especially in the absence of national leadership. You can help amplify the call for action. So approving this resolution tonight, I think, is a vote for a livable future. Thank you. Thank you. The next first up is Mary Jackson on the same topic. And next on the deck would be Barb the Duke. Um, thanks for having me be able to speak here. I've not speak, spoken at a county board meeting before, but I feel so strongly about climate change and the importance of making changes to prevent it that I'm stepping out of my comfort zone. Um, and. What I'm just going to mention is uh, doesn't seem like much of a problem here because our climate has been pretty stable compared to a lot of parts of the country so far. Uh, but science has warned us of climate change and the extremes of drought and storms and floods, and we have seen it in many other areas. 
Um, and it, it doesn't seem to affect us, but it does in a lot of different ways that you might not think of. Um, it, we are all paying taxes that cover these events. Uh, for FEMA, uh, insurance premiums are going up, and you know, food and goods that are are more expensive to process or, or crops that are destroyed because of droughts and floods. Um, so we're all paying that price, and so it's it's important for all of us to step up and try and do something about it. Um, but I haven't heard many proposals from the government about what we're going to do about it. So when I heard of uh, Citizens Climate Lobby's uh, solution of carbon fee and dividend, I felt like that was something I could get behind. Um, Citizens Climate Lobby is a very well organized national organization. Um, they've been working on this for a while uh, and they're very um, bipartisan, they work across the aisle very well, and that is so important to get anything passed. Um, so so the, the organization itself I'm very proud of being a member of, and um, their carbon fee and dividend they put a lot of effort and thought into, um, and there's a lot of details that I, I'm not going to get into here, but somebody else will. Um, but we do need to have incentives to change the way our carbon is being burned and um, the, the big uh, oil companies aren't going to change on their own, we can see that. So the carbon fee and dividend is meant to be an incentive to change the way people are using and burning fuel to become, to use more um, alternatives and cleaner fuels for energy. Um, and having the fee at the source will simplify the collection of it and the money will go directly to the people to offset the increasing cost of goods. Um, so it will not be like a tax increase. Uh, it seems to me the most fair and revenue neutral and bipartisan way to go. Hope that you will vote for it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next person up is uh, Barbara Duke speaking on the same topic. Uh, the next in line is Jim Schumacher. Good evening. Um, my name is Barbara Duke and I live in Eau Claire County near Fall Creek, District 6. I'm also here to support the proposed climate resolution for the Eau Claire County Board to urge the United States Congress to pass legislation that places a revenue, revenue neutral fee on the carbon and fossil fuels. A revenue neutral Carbon fee and dividend plan is a market-based solution that has many benefits. A predictable, steadily increasing fee is placed on carbon at the source. This could be the well, the mine, or the port of entry. The fee encourages businesses and indiv individuals to use less fossil fuels. Then 100% of the money is returned to American households in the form of a dividend. Under carbon fee and dividend, a majority of U.S. households will actually end up with more money in their pockets and low-income households typically benefit the most. The reason low-income households benefit the most is that they typically have lower carbon footprints. They usually have smaller homes, travel less, and buy less. When dividend dollars are distributed back to all households as carbon dividends equally without regard to wealth or energy use, low-income Americans who typically use less energy will come out ahead 90% of the time. Across the country, these resolutions have passed in more than 90 cities and counties, including our Midwest neighbors of La Crosse, Stevens Point, Duluth and Iowa City. I asked the Eau Claire County Board to add its voice to those of us urging meaningful climate action by passing this resolution. Thank you. Thank you. The next person up is Jim Schumacher on the same topic. Following him will be Chad Borkman. I'm Jim Schumacher, 621 Marston Avenue, Eau Claire. And 
Um, I strongly urge you to consider sending a strong message to our lawmakers in Washington. I uh, am here with first-hand knowledge. One week ago today, 1,400 members of Citizens Climate Lobby uh, conducted over 500 meetings with our lawmakers on Capitol Hill. I, myself, uh, was part of three of those meetings, one with our Representative Kine, and one with uh, a representative, Republican representative from Indiana and uh, a third from uh, the North Mariana Islands. We covered every lawmaker. And I did the same um, six months ago in November with yet other lawmakers on Capitol Hill. And from firsthand experience, there is a desire to take action, but they need political coverage. Nobody's gonna stick their neck out unless they know that the people want this. And if you were to send that strong message from Eau Claire, they'll know that there's yet another signal from the populace that uh, action needs to be taken. I personally believe that putting a fee on carbon and distributing those fees to every household in the nation to offset the increased cost of living is the way to go. It's simple, it's transparent, and it is revenue neutral. Is there bipartisan support? I'm here to tell you there is, but they need our support for political coverage. There's a, uh, in the House, there's what's called a um, Climate Solutions Caucus. The Senate doesn't caucus, the House does. Some of you may have heard of the, um, of course you've heard of the Freedom Caucus. There's 36 members. And this uh, Climate Solutions Caucus, there are at present count 78, with uh, one of the recent additions being our own Ron Kind. 78 members, Bipartisan, though, in order to even join, one Republican has to agree with one Democrat to join. It is bipartisan, and it's grown exponentially. It's grown probably, I think, by 10 members just since November when I was last on the Hill. There's gaining momentum, and a signal from Eau Claire County, which I dearly love, will uh, speak very strongly to our lawmakers. It will depoliticize the issue, making it safe and politically smart for elected officials to talk about and then tackle climate change. Uh, being bipartisan, it will be a better, long-lasting, if you will, it's legislation that will stick because later down the road with new administrations and new representatives in the House, they are less likely to overturn a law that had bipartisan support way back when. And this will happen and it can happen and it will make a significant impact on global climate change. I'm convinced of that. So, uh, ask you to draw your okay. remarks to a conclusion. Thank you very much uh, for the time, and again, thank you for your service to our company. Thank you. The next person up is Chad Workman, addressing the issue of ATV trails. After him will be David Huber. Hey, my name is Chad Workman. I'm living in Clark County, Tom Ludington. We've got concerns on the ATV trails staying open to all use for hunters, fishers, berry pickers. Um, they've been open for forever. And they had concerns about the weights of the trucks driving on them. Most of these got semis driving down these trails. It's not a narrow thing or any problems like that. They need to, you know, you got all kinds of vehicles on them right now and we're looking to keep it that way. And then also there's older people that use these trails that don't own ATVs or UTVs or whatever, so they'd have to either go out and buy that or quit using it. There's some of these trails that are going, we're not looking to keep all the trails open for just strictly trucks and ATVs. I mean, some of them will still be shut down from AT, or from truck use and stuff, but there's some that's gonna block off tens of thousands of acres out there that won't be able to get into, I guess. So that's all I got for, you know, thanks. Thank you. The next speaker is David Huber addressing climate resolution followed by Galen Leedside. Hello and uh, thank you all. I am Reverend David Huber, citizen of Eau Claire County, uh, an ordained minister in the United Church of Christ, and also a member of the Citizens Climate Lobby and here to talk uh, in favor of the, uh, the carbon fee and dividend resolution and uh, to say I support it and I hope that you will all, I urge you all to vote in favor of it as well. Climate change is, I think, one of the most significant uh, moral crises 
uh, of our age. We are changing our planet's climate, this world that God created and entrusted into our care, and in doing so, we're putting life at risk uh, and putting especially the poor and the voiceless at risk, both here and around the world. Because it affects not only those of us here in Eau Claire and in Wisconsin, including the possible loss of uh, our wonderful parks that others are here to speak so passionately about this evening. We want to preserve the land that is so wonderful about our state, but also uh, our fossil fuel economy is affecting our neighbors in other states uh, and around the, gro the globe. And ecological disasters and climate change and pollution mostly do affect the poor, those who don't have uh, the voice or the money to fight for themselves. As Jesus said, whatever you do to the least of these, you do to me. And we here tonight certainly cannot change the laws of the world would that Eau Claire have that much power, but we do not. But you as supervisors have the opportunity, and I dare say the vocational duty to encourage our national leaders to show the moral leadership needed to address climate change. You are all good and wonderful people, and I know that you want to do the right thing, and this is the right thing to do. And a small cry by a county might not be much on its own, but added to the cries of other communities, it becomes a united shout thundering across the nation and echoing into the halls of Congress. And I have been in those halls of Congress, and they are very echoey. <laughs> thundering across the nation like the cries of the Hebrew people in bondage of Egypt, a cry that we the people want change. A cry that we the people want to guarantee the health and safety and access to affordable and renewable energy for all of God's people. And I do this uh, because I'm a, a Christian a follower of Jesus. This is part of my faith expression and I believe that this particular solution, carbon fee and dividend, is the most practical and the best way to do it. It benefits everyone because it helps the poor in the interim through dividends and all of us in the long run by moving us into a renewable energy economy. And the symbolic value of this resolution is highly, highly important. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is David Leetzeit. And following him will be, Gary, is Gary Love? Are you here? Gary Love? Sorry. Uh, yeah, I'm just on the, the TV trails and accounting for us. I'm just saying I've been able to do it almost all my life. 50 years almost, and I've been driving a lot of these trails. I've been able to take my kids through all of them all the years, go back and forth. We got to be hunting. They could be up and down the road picking berries or whatever. I've owned an ATV, a UTV in my life. I, I'm not anti against them. There's got to be a place for everybody out here in South and We all got to get along and do that. And I got grandkids that I'd love to see be able to use these trails. However, you know, with me on a truck or on an ATV or whatever it may be. So I am for them to be open. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker I have on the list is Gary Love. Am I pronouncing your name correctly? No, it's Lone. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> Uh, addressing the issue of the trails. Yes. Sorry. Uh, I'm not a four-wheeler or a bear hunter. Uh, I'm it's been with uh, my grandfather when I'm nervous here. Uh, berry picking and hunting, deer hunting. I forget uh, to eat. We drove those trails with cars and pickups back. When it was this tall with my grandfather. I just wish that we could leave the like it is where the trucks can in the four wheelers and if you want to drive down and fishing pull off to the side and park without getting a ticket and walk down down to the falls and go fishing i just wish we could leave those trails open for wheel travel thank you thank you that concludes the list that we have is there any other member of the public who wishes to address the board any other members of the public Last call, any other members of the public? <laughs> the public comment period is now closed. We will move on to our next item on the agenda, reports to the county board under 2.04.320, beginning with oral report from our county administrator, Catherine Shaw. Thank you. You have, um, and it was sent under separate email cover, the list of the Eau Claire County strategic plan, the strategic goals for 2018 to 2020. 
Um, these were actually drafted in the May 1st meeting that you held with department heads. And the detail was synthesized into these um, large strategic goals. The intent tonight is that we will circulate the sheet because this work was done as the committee of the whole and that individuals interested in having the resolution and back sheet drafted to go with this to be considered at next month's meeting will be able to sign that sheet that's going to be circulated and then this will be brought back at your next meeting. Along with that, we will also be working at the department head level to flesh out specific objectives that will actually be part of the actual plan. And those will have more discussion at the committee level as departments talk through that with their committees and decisions about how those different objectives will be achieved will happen at that committee level and then incorporated as needed into the budget and other documents. So this becomes the planning document that the board and others work off of as we um, begin to develop and design the next two years. And so with that, unless there are any specific questions, the county clerk has the sign-up sheet and she will begin with um, Supervisor Borboom and if you'd like to sign that, please do so. Thank you. No, sir. The next item on our agenda is another report, presentation on county-owned real property. Mr. Drexler, Mr. Tyson. Mr. Yes. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Um, I'm Frank Draxler, the Purchasing Director for Eau Claire County, and we're here to present information on the County Facilities Master Plan. So uh, with me is Raj Esslinger, Director of Planning Development, and Matt Tyson, the Directors of Facility. John Johnson worked with us on this project, and he was not <coughs> able to be here today. Um, the goals, I'm going to review the goals, outcomes, and we're going to try and go through this fast. If you have questions, please ask us at the end. But the goals provide information of county property and facilities. So we have lots of property, lots of land, lots of facilities. This gives us a baseline of all our facilities, and it, it, it tells us what surplus properties we have out there. Um, we're presenting a high level of view of this. We have lots of information. Um, we have uh, booklets and pamphlets and, and, and lots of information on computers, electronic, digital information. Our own comes uh, was to provide direction for future reference. We use master plans, as we've always done before, for five to ten years. So we, for facilities, we look and, and uh, use those for future reference for buildings, for needs assessments, for future space needs, and so forth. We have three divisions. So it says facilities, but there's actually more than just buildings. So there's buildings, and, and Matt's going to cover that. Uh, we're going to look at infrastructures, um, and then Rod's going to look at parks, forest lands, and, and other parcels. Okay, I think I went too far, Matt. As you can 
can see um, overall, uh, facilities-wise, the county owns about $195 million worth of facilities. So as you can tell, that takes a lot of money to keep those going. The gov uh, Government Center Master Plan. This was completed in 2017 by Venture & Associates, um, along with input from all the departments that are housed in the Government Center. Uh, the priorities included space needs of all the departments, the safety and security of the buildings, um, and parking, future and expanding. Um, a future jail pod and a potential juvenile detention center, which have been discussed, but were not included in this study. Um, the plan uh, focused on space program. Um, this is the deeper dive area that they went into the courts and looked at the second floor. Um, they looked at human services, looked at the health department, uh, the government center parking, uh, safety and security, and then went into possible project phasing. Um, phasing, uh, the ADRC and Veterans Services co-location that has been completed, that was in the report. Uh, future Branch 6 has been budgeted for this year, although we have not, um, uh, six judges not been appointed. The Human Services uh, remodeling to house the additional employees that were approved is was budgeted and that's actually uh, it's currently under design future projects information systems uh, they're currently spread between third floor of this building and the ag center uh, there's a space carved out in the third floor shelled area for them health department they need more space um, the future area would be to approach in on the loading dock and maintenance area which is why we're on the list if that happens. Um, the rest of them are discussed and could happen at some point. Government Center parking uh, overview. Uh, Two-story parking structure, which would be out in the lot A or possibly in lot D, has been talked about for years. It's been in um, master plans for the last 20 plus years. So this is just showing what could happen. We all know that we're short on parking here. The Chippewa Valley Regional Airport, they had their own master plan completed in uh, 2013. Highway uh, Department Facility Plan was completed in 2016 by Barrientos Design. Uh, the building, this would be for the Altoona shop, uh, the buildings are in poor condition and lack space. Um, they, had, they recommended to look at building a new facility. The cost was estimated at $19 million. Um, and we're currently working with the state DOT for possible um, location. Um, the last major expansion of the Altoona shop was in 1980. Um, the consultants estimate just to bring the building back up to where it should be without doing any expansion would be $3.3 million just to in repairs. Other facility plans that have been completed, uh, the Agri Agricultural and Resource Center was part of the 2017 Government Center Plan. Uh, the Expo Center, there's been several of uh, plans done over the last number of years. And Beaver Creek Reserve uh, just completed their facility master plan in 2017. So we're in this second. So again, it was about facilities, about infrastructure, and about other properties. So with the infrastructure um, included roads, dams, communication systems, and fibers. On the roads and, br and bridges, uh, we have 421 miles of roads. Um, you can see the valuation there. Average condition rating of 5.4. We'll hear that later. It's a PACER rating at 5.4. Current age of highway is 36 years. 80% um, of our uh, highways have failed. Um, and ongoing maintenance, in addition to replacement, ongoing maintenance is $5.1 million. Um, bridges, we have 72 bridges. The valuation there is $2 million. 
And, and you can see the last line on there, the last bullet point, current investment needs of 28 million to bring them up to repair. So the two million was the original cost. That's where that comes from. It's not current, really current value of them, but that's original cost. Cost, they were built a long time ago when the costs were a lot cheaper. And that's the big difference. Um, the dams, everybody knows we have the three dams, Altoona, Eau Claire, and Coon Fork. They're inspected every year. Not a real master plan done on them, but they are inspected and part of what we need to take care of. The towers, um, used for communications, for emergency and non-emergency communications. We, the county owns six towers. So there's, there's 12 plus there's three um, we lease for the whole system, but we own six. We need to uh, take care of those six towers um, and work with the others. One additional tower is added this, being added this year, and that's on the northwest side of, of Oak Park. Um, and then fiber, you've heard about the, the program with SYNC in the past. It, it continues to work with SYNC, uh, a local networking consortium. There's about 330 miles of fiber. Um, the cost of the county was to really to, to match lots of different grants over the years. Um, it's a fraction of the $15 million it cost to put in. Right. So the other part of this project was to um, do an assessment of the property of the, the parcels that we own. And so what we put together is um, some maps and, and, and it basically is an asset management. What department was responsible for which property in the county? So you'll see that uh, you know we have seven parks um, in the county. We have uh, just over 52,000 acres of, of county forest land. Um, most of that is managed, or all of it's managed through the Parks and Forest, uh, Josh Peterson. Uh, we have uh, a master plan that was approved in 2017 for, for Lake Altoona. We have snowmobile trails, ATV trails that were discussed tonight. Um, we have cross-country ski trails. So those are all... Um, uh, amenities that, that are on our property uh, and that are located in, in the county. Average uh, timber sales, you can see that's uh, $1 million. The value of the parks and other lands that we have, um, you can see that the, you know, the number of acres, it's, we, don't, we don't necessarily put a, um, a value on that. Oh, I got the... So, um, so when, when you put this together, we have uh, um, we completed this project um, in the planning and development department and we presented it to the committee on administration in the uh, fall of, of last year. Um, overall we found, um, and this is not uh, an exact number uh, because it is a fluid number, um, 1,523 parcel, or 1,523 parcels that are owned by the county. It's, it's fluid in the sense that we have tax deed parcels that the county clerk is responsible for and, and uh, we get those you know periodically throughout throughout the year sometimes we we do uh, purchase some property um, forest land um, is the majority of the pro property that we have and, and i'll be able to demonstrate that here in a, in a map uh, 1300 parcels and then the parks is 123 parcels that are on we also have several properties that we've identified as surplus property that are, are throughout the uh, the county and that's something that we can uh, you know talk um, further about so this is the uh, Eau Claire County in the map. Um, the, the lighter, the lime green properties that you see on the, on the map, I'll use this because I think most of you are looking. Um, you know, that's, that's our, that, those are our, our forest lands. And um, the red parcels are, are some that are unknown. Our lime, our lime green properties are our parks property and you'll see up here um, to the north is our, the Eau Claire County, or the uh, Eau Claire Airport. And so we're just gonna... I have examples more specifically of, of those in a presentation here. So again, I just mentioned the um, airport property um, that we maintain. Of course, they test this multiple times and uh, there we go. So we have, this is another, uh, uh, another view, Lake Eau Claire. Um, you can see how we, once we start honing in on, on this area, you can see that we have forest land, we have uh, parks land. And again, we can zoom in. This is the Eau Claire County Parks. Uh, you'll see that there's one of the dam structures uh, 
um, in and around this area right here that we maintain that was mentioned previously. I'll just go through here. This is Lake Altoona. Lake Altoona, we have uh, obviously uh, Lake Altoona County um, Park. We have some, we have the dam structure. Uh, we have the highway department and we have some other property that uh, are islands. And uh, again, the highway department and then also the egg center that was discussed. So I'm showing this just as the um, capability that, you know, when we talk about this at committee level or county board level, we can actually start, you know, identifying with these properties where they actually are located. I think it's important um, that the county board, the decision made, the elected officials um, understand where, where our properties are. That was uh, uh, Lowe's Creek. These are uh, properties that um, are managed through the Parks Department that were acquired through a FEMA grant uh, back in 1995. Um, so we're utilizing those as, as open space. There's a boat ramp at the end of um, at, at the end of the road there. And we also have some miscellaneous properties. Uh, this is a, a highway property that uh, you know was was a county highway at one time, but when the interstate came through, uh, we still uh, still own that. So that, that might be a property that we could look to uh, uh, work with adjacent property owners and maybe sell that property, get it back on the uh, tax rolls. Here's the uh, Augusta uh, Highway Department or Highway Shop. I just got a couple more here. We also maintain, uh, we have a cemetery that <clears throat> was part of the uh, county farm, if you think back, uh, the county had that property at one point. And then, uh, you know, again, this is a, a wayside that's out on Highway 85 that the county has uh, under its ownership. The Red Triangle is another, pers another property that we acquired in 1995 uh, through that FEMA um, hazard mitigation property. It was a, it was a flooded property. So. And we'll make that, uh, we'll, we'll make those maps more accessible to the uh, to the county board um, as we uh, as we continue to move through here. So I think we're almost done. Right? Yep. Two more slides. So we just um, while we're getting there, um, we have the information for those three different the buildings, the parcels, um, and the infrastructure. Uh, we have them on file. We're going to use them um, for the next five to ten years uh, until they're updated. Um, here's a list of the different match plans for most of the buildings, but in there the parcels are very important and, and we're, we're happy we got that completed. Um, we have one more slide. I'm not switching over. Okay. So just a summary, we believe we met the goal for, for getting this inventory and the baseline. Um, we have many master plans. Uh, this does not rank one project over another. So we, we use this information for future budgeting, um, but at this time we did not rank one over another. We will do that during the budget process along with you. Um, it indicates values, but again, those are the insured values, may not be the replacement values. They're not the replacement values. Um, when we'd like to acknowledge staff and the different consultants that worked on this, committee members and other volunteers. So the next steps, is, as I indicated, we use this as a guide. We continue moving forward. And when we need space, we have some material we can refer back to. Um, and if there's further direction from the county board or committees, um, we appreciate that information as well. Thank you. Thank you for your report. Uh, just a reminder that uh, we're not discussing any specifics tonight. If you have some general questions, I'm sure the, the three gentlemen would be happy to answer those. Uh, Supervisor Leary. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, the question I had is I thought it might be helpful if on the county board, you know, we have the site online that they put information for supervisors. And I think it would be helpful if we could get a copy of the plan that you were talking about so that other than the topical slides, we could look through it and help us with our decision making. <laughs> Thank you for the reminder. We plan to do that. Supervisor Schaff. Oh, sir. Minister Schaff. And actually, um, as um, Mr. Drexler said, we will make sure that these are on our website. 
and that we'll have all of the presentation materials there as well as you saw the list of all the different plans we actually have a portion of the budget that actually talks about non-fiscal plans and there's a listing in on our web page in the area of the budget and we actually have live links to all of those planning documents so that you can go through and look at those if you desire that level of specificity. Thank you. Thank you for your report. Supervisor Stelges. Oh, I'm, pardon me, Supervisor Stelges. Uh, Frank, I'm a little confused about the values <coughs> that you showed in the first slide there. Are those market values, acquisition values, or? The first slide was um, the facilities, and those are the insured values. The what? Insured values. Insured values. So that would generally be a market value? That would generally, yes, at the time. So our insurance on the larger facilities uh, was here two or three years ago, and, and they're insured for that value. Um, so at the time it was about market value. Any other questions? Thank you for your report. You'll see on your agendas that the next item under number six is work reports and the contingency fund report. That's for your review. Item number seven in the agenda is presentation of petitions, claims, and communications. This is a record of communi communications received. These, these items will go into uh, the oversight committees and come back to the board. But we have re two rezoning requests, one from Timothy Hansen and one from Jeffrey Michelle Smith, and two requests for exemption from the county library system from the village and the town of Fairchild. And those will come back. Those should get referred to finance and budget. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, those are referred specifically to finance and budget. Supervisor Pergonis, is that correct? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Next item on our agenda is first reading of ordinances by committee. Supervisor Bates. Pardon me, Supervisor, Supervisor Bates. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I just wanted to add to these announcements. On Monday, the Human Services Department is offering County Board Supervisors an opportunity to tour the department that would start at 2.30 and would last until 4.50. So if they have availability at that time and are interested, that would be the time to be there. Thank you. Are there any other announcements or communications? Thank you very much. Our next item is item eight, first reading of ordinances by committees, beginning with committee on administration, file 33. To repeal chapter 2.95 point of the code living wage. That item uh, will be referred to, uh, that will come back to the county board for consideration in the next county board meeting in July. Uh, the next item is under committee on planning and development. We have moved to the end of the agenda because they are actually uh, second reading, not first. So we will come to those at the end of the meeting tonight. The next item is uh, from committees on highway and finance and budget, file uh, number 40. Creating chapter 4.110 of the code, annual county vehicle registration fee. This item will come back to uh, uh, the county board for second reading and action in the meeting in July. The next item is from Committee on Parks and Forests, file number 35. To read letter section 16.30.005X through Z as Z through double B of the code definitions and to create section 16.30.005X and Y of the code definitions to repeal and recreate 16.30.010C of the code designation of park, special use area, and wayside boundaries and lands subject to this chapter. Supervisor Lavelle. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would like to move this under suspension of the rules. Uh, we've been dealing with this since March, and I'd like to try to move it forward and, and act on it tonight. We have a motion to suspend the rules. Is there a second to that motion? Second from Supervisor Gibson. Uh, this item um, is now up for a vote. It's not debatable, and it requires a two-thirds majority to pass. 
Uh, supervisors, please take your keypads and indicate your Do you want okay, to explain it first? Mm. Not the suspension. Well, he, he should explain me. No, that's coming up when they make the motion. Oh, it's just yeah. Clarification, Mr. Chair. Uh, which supervisor? Miller, <laughs> sorry. We are voting on the motion to suspend. Yes, that is correct. Oh, okay. That is correct. Thank you. Do we have the vote up? Oops, sorry. I thought I sorry. Had, I thought well, I advanced. Sorry. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> oh. Why is it not appearing? There we go. Please indicate your votes now. Supervisor Russell, thank you. That motion passes by more than a two-thirds majority. Uh, the, uh, the issue is now before us. Uh, I look for a motion to be made. We voted on the suspension <coughs> rules. So now I'm asking for a motion on the resolution. Sorry. Under suspension, you don't need a motion? We don't. Not under suspension. It's just before us, we, did a, we don't need a motion or a second, so the item which is up under discussion now. Correct. Sorry. Supervisor Novell. I, I would like to add an amendment to that, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we have an amendment being offered. What is your amendment? It's in your packet. Amendment number one. Okay. And it adds uh, two more trails to the, res or to the ordinance. Okay. You have that item apparently in your packets in front of you. Uh, this is a motion to amend. It does require a second. A second from Supervisor Gibson. We have a motion and a second regarding the amendment. Is there any discussion of the amendment? Any discussion or questions? Supervisor Stelches. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. So this. Uh this may be confusing to a lot of people. Uh, even to all of us who have lived with this for well, these many months. Um, so, so the baseline motion here opens up one trail for uh, any motor vehicle use. Uh, the amendment uh, adds two additional trails to that. So just as a little bit of background, uh, we have uh, 19 miles of designated ATV trails within the county. And I'm just going to round the numbers. But these are ATV trails that are not roads. They're basically trails through the county forest, and many of them go through some of the more remote and undeveloped areas of the county forest. And uh, as the fact sheet says, uh, and a number of people spoke about it in public comment, uh, the truth is people have been in, in some of those instances driving on these trails with things other than ATVs for a number of years. And it came to our attention via the DNR that that was not allowed uh, under the funding model uh, that, we, uh, that we were operating. Uh, and so uh, we went back and forth with uh, the DNR to try to get clarification for that. And uh, ultimately, uh, I think it, uh, was concluded that this is not a financial issue because the DNR has given us the option to to uh, change the designation on some of these trails. Excuse me, Secretary Stelches. Yes. I believe that you're addressing the main motion. Could I'm you confront your comment to the amendment? Uh, well, I think that it's relevant to the amendment. No, please make a brief then. So, so the, the, the guts of the amendment is which, which trails are open and which trails are not. And uh, the committee uh, voted 2-2 uh, uh, on this amend amendment at the committee level, so it failed at the committee level. And we all agreed that we would bring it forward to the board here. Uh, I, I was one of the oppositional votes mm -hmm. because I believe that the two that are represented by the uh, amendment uh, are not um, uh, necessary 
for good access into the county forest. The one that was approved, I, I do support and think that it should. The two that are represented by the amendment go through some of the <coughs> most remote and undeveloped areas within the county forest. I think that it's an expectation of people who use those trails that they won't meet uh, other motor vehicles on there. I know I've personally ATV'd and snowmobiled and hiked and, and, and uh, walked and snowshoed on all of those trails. And the two that are in question, uh, I would have no expectation of ever meeting a motor vehicle on there other than hearing an ATV coming. I think it does present a potential safety issue and the farthest that those trails would take you from any other road is about a mile, maybe a mile and a quarter at the most. So you could walk uh, from a road on which you could drive a vehicle to any point on those trails within one mile. Or of course, you could drive an ATV. So to that end, I think that it's important that we maintain some tiers within our county forest. Some are highly accessible, some are less accessible. And so these particular two, I would like to see confined to ATV traffic. Thank you. Any uh, Supervisor Lavelle. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, these are the two trails that they have been driving on for the last 50 or 60 years. There's motor vehicles that have been on those trails. I don't know if uh, Supervisor Stelich has been out there that often, but these hunters use those trails. They're not used a lot, and everybody, and one of the things on the committee uh, was saying that they didn't want to four lane highway going to the county forest. Well, Kevin Seldes hasn't seen many vehicles. There's not, a, there's not a lot of use out there. And a matter of fact, there's less use now than there probably was 10 years ago. And as far as tearing those roads apart, those people out there, are, are, it's, it's their forest and they take care of it. And so that's one of the reasons I put it in there. So the people, and I don't know if there's only a mile difference, but a mile's a long way for some people to walk through the county forest. And, and a lot of people can't afford ATVs. And I think that everybody should be allowed to use the county forest uh, in those areas. And some of those areas, you take it out, take this to probably 10,000 acres of land out there. So I would hope that uh, the board would uh, support this amendment uh, because there's no loss in funding. And that's one of the things when I went back to the state, first they were gonna cut off the funding and I figured, well, we don't have much choice cut our funding off. But they came back, they were pressured by the uh, their constituents, the legislators were to change that so we could uh, grandfather these trails in. As far as heavy trucks and tearing them apart, those trails are pretty rough. I mean, you're not gonna go around t tearing them apart. And one of the things that was brought up at the committee meeting was uh, one ton trucks pulling a fifth wheel or two there, if anybody's been into there, they're not going to take a one-ton truck dually but a fifth wheel back there. And another one was opening up uh, to a four-lane highway to there, which uh, we're not going to put any more money into those. They're not going to develop the trails any more than they are. And one of the questions where somebody spoke is that uh, the funding for that, the funding does not come from any of this. It comes through uh, 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 funding from the DNR that pays that. It's not anything to do with county roads. It's a different funding. Same funding they use for forest roads. So like I said, these people have been using this for years and a lot of people can't afford an ATV uh, to go out there. And I, I don't think they should be penalized. And as far as dumping stuff, if you look at, uh, and I went in a, a committee where people were dumping, most of people dump stuff within a mile of the landfill. For some reason, they go out there to find out. But well, there's not a lot of problems with dumping out there. And if people are going to dump stuff in those roads, they're going to do it at night. And if they got to pick them, most people aren't going to come driving through there and pick up in the daytime, all on a couch in the back, going on those roads. So I wish the I wish the county, uh, the board would pass this and move it forward, so uh, so these people can get back to where they were, because they have been using these roads for a long time. Thank you. Thank you. Supervisor DeLuca. Um, yes. I, so, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm looking in our packet, and um, 
there is a trail, a river trail, that circled, and I believe that's the original trail that was um, going to become the hybrid trail. And then the two that you're adding are the White Tail Ridge and the Chicani Forest Road. Is that correct, Supervisor McGraw? All right. So our packet says when you go from an ATV trail to a hybrid trail, you lose $100 funding in maintenance. And the overall loss of funding for the 4.15 mile stretch of trail, which is the river trail, um, would be for $415 annually. So if we were to add the Whitetail Ridge and the Chicane Forest Road, what kind of loss of maintenance dollars will we receive with those two added as hybrid trails? Supervisor LaBelle, do you wish to address that? The most you can lose, it is not get, you're not <coughs> a sure thing that you're going to lose that $100 a mile. But the most you could lose is 100 You might not lose anything. So the most it would be, I think, with 1300 some dollars that you could lose on that. I mean, it's, but it's a, you know, it's, it's a county, county forest that uh, people use and the taxpayers, you know, it's, a, it's a, something that is, it's all our forest, you know. So I don't think $1,300 for a lot of people to use that part of, is, a, is a lot of money. Supervisor DeLuca, what's your question answer? Um, yes, um, I guess at this point in time, I would support the river trail. Um, I'm not so sure I'm interested in the other two. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Supervisor Gibson. I think it's on. Isn't it? Speak very loudly then. <laughs> no, he, he needs to be on. He's on. No, it's on. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Um, just to add to this here, this is my district out there. I've used that county forest for exactly what they're talking about here my whole entire life. When I was 12 years old, my grandpa took me out there hunting in those woods and used these trails long before they ever became uh, ATV use also. So they've been multiple use trails for years and years and years. In 2012 and 2013, the state rewrote the regulations for ATVs. That's how this whole thing changed. Now, we also got to keep in mind in 2012, Mike Torrud was the director of Parks and Forest and he retired that year. Mr. Peterson was not hired until 2013. So a lot of this, they probably weren't even aware of until recently, okay? Now, back in 2013, what they do is these multi-use trails, they call them trouts, okay? So, because of that time, like there, there's a lot of counties that have already changed and designated certain parts of these trails that were multi-use for all those years, they designated to be trouts. That's all we're asking for is the three trails that have always been used, okay? Some counties, because of the confusion in when this whole thing was all rewrote, still haven't done anything, okay? We have an opportunity right now to take those trails that have always been, the three trails that are mentioned, that have always been multiple use trails, to grandfather those in, and that's all we're asking for. So I would highly ask for your support so that I can continue to use it as I have been for the last 50 plus years. Thank you. That would be the amendment plus the one that's in the main motion. Supervisor Pagonis. I have some questions. Uh, the top of the fact sheet says that totally, we have a total of 19.7 miles of ATV and UTV trails. Um, then the foot, well, I guess it's not the footnote, the, the page with the map on it that's signed by uh, Director of Parks and Forests uh, refers to a 4.15 mile stretch and I'm assuming that that's the river trail although it doesn't 
tell me that? Um, so then my question goes to the Cheney Forest Trail and the White Tail, uh, the White, um, White Tail Ridge Trail. What is that mileage? That's nowhere to be found. And so, just so we can calculate the overall percentages. Yeah, um, I think that Josh, one of the pages. should we have Josh answer it? Okay. <laughs> Without objection. Yes, come up and use one of the microphones. It's a long hike. So would you please address the Supervisor Bergonis' question? Sure. The two sections that you were questioning were the Cheney Forest section is 5.16 miles. And the sections of Whitetail Ridge, there's two sections. One of them is 2.00 miles, and one is 1.28 miles. So it's an additional 8.46. Did that answer your question? Oh, uh, so just so I understand, it, so the amendment is two times the length of the original motion. So the original motion is four miles, and the amendment is adding an additional eight and a half. Sounds like. Okay. Just making sure. Thank you. Thank you. Supervisor Miller, Josh, would you stay there just in case? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, now I'm really thoroughly confused. Uh, and thinking that this was going to be first reading and I'd have time to discuss or have some questions answered. Um, but be that as it may, I did agree to suspend the rules. <laughs> so uh, the first thing, the amendment already calls these trails hybrid, but they aren't, correct? At, in the current realistic become Josh, secret. If that Correct. passes, okay, that's what you're you are on your call it. Okay, Supervisor Gibson, you re made reference to grandfathering these in. So what you're saying is we've had these ATV trails, people have been using them beyond the ATV slash UTV type authorization and now you want to bring them in to be well not, okay uh, supervisor is that, is that correct Sorry. almost okay <laughs> okay <laughs> supervisor gibson they were multiple use trail in fact these were old logging ones long before atv before it was even an atv trail okay so they've been there for ever since i was a kid okay <clears throat> Then they were we used those existing a lot of those existing logging rules to make ATV trails. They always were multiple use trails up until 2012 and 2013 when they rewrote the regulations for ATV trails. Then at that point in time also they created these what they call trails for the hybrid hybrid trails so that counties could keep them and you know as multi-use trails. Okay. Thank Supervisor you. Miller, is your question answered? Yeah. yeah. Supervisor Stelches, I believe, is next. Uh, no, I didn't have a comment. Oh, sorry. I your light was lit here. Okay, thank you. Well that one's well, I guess there's other speakers here too. Oh uh, Supervisor Dunning. I guess I need some clarification on the cost then. If we're looking at uh, an additional eight some miles plus the original five, we're looking at what, $1,300 of lost money? Maybe. About $100 Maybe. per mile? Maybe. We might not lose anything. Josh. That, that is the way we're interpreting it right now, that there is a potential to lose that $100 a mile on funding. Um, the DNR has not been committal on saying whether we will or not. They do say that they are looking into um, options to maintain the funding at current levels. 
but we do not have a definite an answer on that right now. Right now, we know that the worst case scenario would be to lose $100 per mile on the maintenance funding. Supervisor Knight. Yes, can you hear me? I, I always thought a trout was a fish. Um, I, I did have a question about the funding, which appears to be a little bit in a state of flux. So, um, worst case scenario, we lose only $100 a mile for, from going to an ATV tra trail to a trout. Correct. I'm also a little bit worried about the safety. I, I was down grouse hunting in Clark County once, and I ran into a, there was an ATV in it truck that were going opposite ways uh, and they collided and it was kind of a mess they had to bring in the Mayo helicopter which was hard to do in a county forest so I'm wondering are the, uh, are the ATVs aware if they're using these trails that they might turn around a corner and there'll be a, a truck coming the other way. Do you want to respond to that? Supervisor Lavelle was next to speak. Gibson just wants want to, to answer the question. Answer okay, <laughs> Supervisor Gibson. All right, thank you. The reason why I wanted to answer this question is because being that I live out there and use these, I've also talked to the ATV clubs and stuff like that to see if there hasn't been any instances to this date, and they have no problem with any other motor vehicle. Thank you. Supervisor McKinney. Thank you. Uh, in the past life, for 14 years, I was a bear hunter. I know that's hard to believe. <laughs> but I know how important... There's a little known fact about one of those. <laughs> I know the importance of being able to use these trails um, when you're hunting for bear and coyote and fox. And so I will support maintaining... Yeah, the trails were there before the ATVs were. I think it should. they should be multiple use. Thank you. Thank you. Supervisor Gappin. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, as someone who grew up in Washburn County on 80 acres and learned to drive on logging trails when I was about 12 years old, I can respect the access to the county forests. I think our county forests are one of our biggest assets that we have. I'm just concerned um, that maybe the ATE, ATV clubs are going to maybe expect some trails all to themselves and some more monies for maintenance to keep those trails to them and not and keep the four wheels off so they might ask for that thank you supervisor stunches thank you mr chair now i really did want to speak so. okay <laughs> um, so i just wanted to make a, a couple other points we in, in addition to 19 miles of atv trails we also have 11 miles of routes, uh, which allow trucks on in the county forest. These are county forest roads, they're not township roads. We have 11 miles of forest roads uh, on which motor vehicles are already allowed. So then we go to the most remote designation, the 19 miles of ATV trails. If we pass this amendment, we're basically taking two thirds of all of our ATV trails and we're now making them essentially roads. Uh, and again, I would, I would acknowledge the fact that people have used them uh, for quite some time, uh, although I would also like to look forward and say as our population grows, we already see it today, we get more and more pressure on our resources. More and more people want to go deeper and deeper into, into the county forest and at some point in time, there needs to be an expectation that you cannot drive in your vehicle up to every place in the forest. I think that there has to be some places where you, you either have to get out and walk, or you might, if you have an ATV, you can use an ATV. So that's why these two particular ones, uh, I am not in favor of, although the other one I am. Thank you. Supervisor DeLuca for the second time. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, you men um, mentioning uh, on the floor of grandfathering the trails in, I am interested to find out is there a specific time limit on moving these trails in? Is there like a grandfather, you only have one year to get them grandfathered in and then once they're set, they're set. Um, I'm looking for 
clarification for that. Sure, From Josh. Sure. I, I believe the original intent when these trouts or hybrid trails were created that counties were supposed to apply for them that year and that was your window to do this because they changed some of the regulations as far as how the funding works. If we were to say create hybrid trails right now, the funding would be half of the amount that we're talking about. As far as the grandfathered amount is the full amount. Um, that amount was applicable back in 2013. So what the state is essentially saying is, is that these trails were created before 2013. They were in existence as dual use trails back then and that we would qualify for funding at that rate when they were first eligible to be applied for. Um, so we really do have, I think we have a, a limited opportunity to try to resolve this issue. Um, if we do not switch any of these over right now, I don't know if they will allow us to grandfather them at a later date. I, we could switch them over to hybrid trails at a later date, but the funding levels would be at half of the level that they're going to be offered as being grandfathered. Supervisor DeLuca? Yes, would, um, so let's say um, if people are in agreement on the <coughs> one trail that was in the packet and circled, but they're unsure about the two amendment trails, um, and it were to come back in our, you know, July or August meeting, is that not possible to grandfather them in at that point, or does it have to be like tonight? I would think that we would still have an opportunity at that point in time. Uh, now, if we wait two years and bring it back, I, I wouldn't think that that would still be on the table, but if it's still in that short time window, I think that it would. All right, thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, Supervisor Miguel, this would be your third time speaking, so without objection. I thought I answered the question, but I don't know. Oh, excuse me, okay. <laughs> you may proceed. I don't know why we'd want to bring it back in two or three months. I'll give you a little history. I was on the board for a long time. I have been on for a long time. 20, about 25 I'll years ago, to speak. at the time John Stacy was uh, director, no, he wasn't too. a big fan of ADVs. Three, four, and we had a, maybe a Once mile stretch. Off, he went down to Fairchild, he parked your vehicle down there, and then everybody went to Clark County and spent their money in Clark County. So I said, hey, wait a minute. You know, why are we sending everybody down to Clark County to spend their money? Can't they spend their money in Clark County? So these, these trails that we're talking about were in existence long before the ATVs came along. So they used them trails. They didn't just go in the woods and make a trail for an ATV because those trails were already there, used by the trucks, I don't know how many years prior to 25 years ago. So it's not like they got money and went in there and used and made the trails. The trails were already there and they've been used by the trucks and they've been using that way forever. As far as losing, $1,300, I've never seen anybody, people be so worried about $1,300 when you're gonna probably gain that much for people coming in, spending money, hunting, and as far as, <coughs> if you talk to these people now, there's probably less people using that county forest than there was 20 years ago. But most of these kids, you can't get away from their video games and their own, and that's why they dropped the hunting age yep. so, so young, so people are going in the woods. They dropped the deer anyway, oh, uh, no, 10 years old or 5 years old. So I wish you would support this and we could move forward because this is something that people have been, use, been using forever. And let them hunt and fish and, you know, and it's not, it's for people who use it all year round, well, not for the people. Thank you. Supervisor Gibson. All right, I'm done for the second time. <laughs> Finally. <laughs> all right, thanks. No, I just want to make a comment about uh, all the use that was brought up that was going to be out there. I remember back in the, going back to when I was a kid out there again, back in the 60s and 70s, I can guarantee you there's probably a tenth of the people out there now using it today than what there was back then. It has went backwards a lot. There's not that many people using it anymore. Thank you. Uh, Supervisor Henning. Thank you, Mr. Chair. 
the highway committee is the approving body for uh, ATV trails in the county. As chairman of the committee, I want to report that we have approved many, many, many miles of new trails for ATVs in all throughout our county, in the southern and the, the north and uh, the eastern part. So there isn't any shortage of ATV trails. They can get anywhere now uh, to connect to Clark County and and uh, other places. So we've we've had a big request for new trails, and they've been approved. So there isn't any shortage of AV TV trails. I hope you you support the amendment. Thank you, Supervisor Beckfield. Actually, my question's been answered. Thank you. Thank you. Supervisor Chilson. Uh, mine, likewise. Thank you. <laughs> I can't move that fast. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, Supervisor Bates. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Josh, you know, one of the concerns here was safety, and especially having, apparently, a vehicle, vehicle go back in and then finding another vehicle coming out as they're going in. Is there any reason why you couldn't, first of all, designate these as mixed-use trail by signage and caution that you may meet other vehicles? Excuse me, Supervisor Bates. You're addressing the main motion. We're on the amendment of the two trails. Oh, well, um, I'll wait till I get back Please. to Please, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Supervisor Coffey. I just want to ask for clarification because I also worry about the safety issue and that is, is there a speed limit if we have vehicles um, or, you know, or tire, actual cars or trucks? What is the speed limit? Again, I believe that you're addressing a motion. Oh. So I'd ask you to wait on that okay. if that's okay. Supervisor Morris. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'm also on the Parks and Forest Committee. Uh, re recently, uh, just got on that committee. Uh, as as a beginning explanation of why we're in this situation, it's because uh, when when a trail was designated as ATV trail, we really did not respect the designation. It was designated <coughs> as an ATV trail, eventually then UTV. That did not include other vehicles, and those other vehicles continue to drive on it. And I'm not sure that you also are not addressing I, the main motion. So consequently, the issue of safety, in my opinion, because there are other vehicles applied to the uh, two other suggested trails, is that I think we need to make certain that there are options that when uh, some mother has come to me and said, gee, I want my kids to ride on these ATV trails, and I want to make sure they have choices where they can go in the forest where they're not going to interact with uh, cars and trucks. So consequently, that's why I would support not adding the other two trails. Thank you. I do not see any other, oh, sorry, spoke too soon. Supervisor Henning. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. For Chair. For the second time. <laughs> You know, the ATVs have approval to ride on roads as well to get from location to location. So it's not a problem of cars and ATVs because they drive on the roads too. And so they're, they're meeting cars all the time. And, and the roads are approved uh, routes. Thank you. I see no other Supervisor who wishes to speak. So at this point, I ask you to take up your keypads and vote on the, you're voting on the amendment, only the amendment. Please vote. We have 14 yes and 14 no. <laughs> we are split, and since there is not um, a clear majority, I believe that the amendment is defeated. 
So the amendment is defeated at this point. Thank you. Uh, we are now back to the main motion. Is there anyone who wishes to speak to the main motion? Uh, Supervisor Stelches. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So while we've touched upon the main motion and, and the essence of it, of the three trails that were requested, uh, this is by far and away the most heavily trafficked. While on some of your maps you may see that this is called the River Trail, uh, it's also known as Hamilton Falls Road to many people who have used it. And, um, uh, and I myself have used it for many years, assuming that it was entirely legal to drive a vehicle on there. Uh, it is the only of the three that provides access to the Oakla River, the North Fork, and takes you between Cheney Road up to the Wilson Park area, including Hamilton Falls. It also gives you access to the corridor for the gas line and the high line that goes, travels east and west through that main core uh, piece of the Eau Claire County Forest uh, and uh, provides us multiple spots where people can stop in vehicles along the way and walk within 100 yards to the river to fish uh, and do other activities. Uh, I think there is a high expectation of ATV users on this trail that you will run into motor vehicles. Uh, as I said, I myself have done that for many, many years. Uh, also, it is the most improved and that just, Josh, do correct me if I'm wrong, but it was either last year or the year before, we received a, over $100,000 of special improvement grant money from the DNR ATV funds to improve that trail. And when you drive on it right now, it looks like a pretty good, uh, pretty good road because it's well graveled, the bridges have been repaired. It's kind of like a road. So I fully support opening this one up to all motor vehicle traffic. It also, I, I might say, provides um, the only viable route if you wanted to get from the town of Wilson up north uh, down to the Cheney Road area, unless you want to go all the way out to Highway H and back around, uh, you come down this corridor. So it is truly needed for traffic and recreational flow in the area, and I would ask for everybody's support on this. Thank you. I see no other indications that someone wishes to speak to this, so please take your keypads in hand. You are, I will ask the clerk to reiterate the uh, item on which we're voting. Well, it was relettering uh, sections of the code and uh, listing the special use area subject to this chapter of the Tower Ridge Recreation Area Lions Club Youth Pond. Um, I, I'm sorry, I see a light lit. Supervisor Knight, did you, are you indicating a wish to speak? That's okay. Okay. Uh, please uh, take your keypads and vote. Okay, we have 25 yes, 3 no. The motion passes. The next item on our agenda, we'll find under item 10, file number 14. Establishing a desired average highway condition rate. Oh, 40. Oh, 14. 14. Yeah, That's what I have. Sorry, little conference. Sorry. Approving the amended Chippewa Valley Innovation Center Loan Fund Agreement. Uh, motion. Motion from Supervisor Gatlin. Second from Supervisor Beckfield. Explanation from uh, Administrator Shaw. Thank you. The Chippewa Valley Innovation Center is a facility that is managed by the Eau Claire Area Economic Development Corporation, and their goal and role is to encourage new and emerging entrepreneurs and helping them utilize local community resources. In order to do that, they provide warehouse manufacturing space, they provide managerial support, technical assistance, and access to financial programs. Chippewa County has asked to become a financial partner in this endeavor, 
and you see before you an amended contract that allows Chippewa County to participate. The specific changes are um, including the Chippewa County EDC and Chippewa County as partners, and it gives a contribution schedule on the last page <coughs> that indicates how much they will be participating financially. It also amends the contract so that tenants, when they are through with their occupancy of the Innovation Center and they relocate, they are able to locate in either Eau Claire County or Chippewa County, so it's a more regional approach to the Innovation Center. Formerly, they had to relocate in Eau Claire County or they would have had to return um, the loans and or financial assistance they had received. Thank you. Is there any supervisor who wishes to address this resolution? I see no lights indicating. Oops, no. Sorry? Supervisor Pagonis. Oh, I'm sorry. Supervisor Pagonis. I just have some questions about the attachment. I'm a little bit confused. The county historically has donated about 10000 a year to the Chippewa Valley Innovation Center. This uh, schedule is something different from that? Is that what I'm trying to understand? Yes. The schedule itself is for participation in the loan program that is offered through the Chippewa Valley Innovation Center. Not the actual. nothing to do with our contribution? No, ma'am. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I see no other lights lit. Certainly not one else who wishes to address this. Supervisors, please take your keypads and vote on file 14, approving the amended Chippewa Valley Innovation Center Loan Fund Agreement. That item passes unanimously. Thank you. The next item on our agenda is file number 19. Recognizing climate change and urging Congress to levy a revenue neutral fee on carbon <coughs> in fossil fuels. Motion by Supervisor Leary, second by Supervisor Kronk. Uh, explanation, Supervisor Dunning. Sorry, did I catch you off guard? <laughs> Back in the last century, somewhere around 1995, I was in a, at the EPA office in downtown Chicago listening to the EPA promoting the use of, of uh, carbon uh, taxing to address carbon dioxide issues. Uh, we haven't gone very far in those last 20 some years. Uh, but this is an opportunity tonight where we have uh, this resolution that we have before us allows us as a county board to urge the uh, Congress to pass legislation that levels an annually increasing revenue neutral fee on the carbon and fossil fuels. Um, as I indicated, it's taken a while for this to come about and we haven't had this, the support that we've needed, but now let's, we have an opportunity to uh, give our voice in changing that and uh, county resolutions. Uh, this is very similar to the one that was at Lacrosse County and several other counties in Wisconsin. It will go on to the counties association as well as to our legislative people in Washington and in Madison. So uh, we were, would like your support on this and if you have other questions let me know. Thank you. Supervisor Chilson. I'm sorry? I didn't, I didn't push my button to speak. I will check with Supervisor Beckfield. I think he's sneaky. <laughs> <laughs> he's a sneaky character. <laughs> Supervisor I'll Knight. Speak. I'll speak. I guess he's going down the line. No, no time. <laughs> um, last time I was just going to fess up the like, supervisor's intelligence. I have multiple reasons of driven my car down the river road to, to watch a canoe on the Oakland River. So. Um, but on the issue of climate change, I want to congratulate the committee on administration. I think it's a, a wonderful idea. The carbon tax is probably the best uh, mechanism available. Uh, carbon is um, what they used to call it, not in economics, an externality. When we burn fossil fuel, we get carbon. Uh, it goes up in the atmosphere and makes the climate warmer. By putting a tax on it, you discourage people uh, from 
around doing that wherever possible. Um, the revenue neutral part of it is you, you have a tax, you get some money. Um, if we do tax uh, coal burning power plants, uh, our electricity is going to go up a little bit perhaps. You give it back to folks so they can uh, deal with those higher electricity bills. At least that's the theory of the revenue neutral part. I don't know how it will work out, but uh, I think it's a wonderful resolution. I urge everyone to support. Thank you. Uh, Supervisor Buchanan. Thank you. You know, I, I really don't want to spend too much time going into whether or not climate change itself is real. You know, we've seen 100-year floodings, 500-year floodings, 1,000-year floodings. Um, these stories just keep piling up and are all too real. Uh, just yesterday, Governor Walker declared a state of emergency in five counties in Wisconsin for mudslides and flash floods. I also think it's fitting that we're debating this on the very month of the 10-year anniversary when 30 counties were declared a state of flooding emergency under then Governor um, Jim Doyle. More and more these unusual levels of flooding are becoming more and more usual and people are literally dying. Furthermore, even military reports show that climate change is a threat to our national security. But whether or not climate change is real or not is not the point of my speech. Uh, the point of my speech is on if this specific proposal is effective or not, and if it's the right solution to this problem. And simply put, uh, for me, this proposal is the per perfect example between free market capitalism and socialism. And I believe in the free market, and I believe in capitalism. And I know there's a lot of folks who don't want to see socialism, so therefore I'm going to be voting yes. You see, there's a famous book written by a gentleman named Adam Smith, He's often known as the founder or the father of capitalism, and he wrote a book called The Wealth of Nations. In this book, Adam Smith discussed how if certain economic conditions are met, markets will create the optimal distribution of resources. But if any of those conditions are not met, markets are distorted, and government must step in to correct those conditions and truly restore a free market. This proposal, the fee and dividend, hits at the heart of one of the major market distortions that currently exist for climate change. It's something called an externality, as Joe and I had mentioned a few moments earlier. And an externality is just a fancy word for saying you're pushing your cost of doing business onto other people, and that isn't right, and that isn't capitalist. What do I mean by they're pushing their cost of business onto other people? Well, when we've talked about this flooding that we've seen, who's paying to fix this flooding? Who's paying to repair the roads? Who's paying to rebuild those houses? Are the corporate polluters paying? No, they're pushing that cost of doing business onto us. We as families pay. We as communities pay. The public pays with their own dollars and with their tax dollars. Furthermore, as climates change and ecosystems change, there's new bacteria, new insects, and new animals that come into communities, and folks are being made sicker. In fact, the EPA has added Lyme's disease as its list of climate change indicators, with rates more than doubling since 1991, and that's just one example. Question, who's paying those medical bills? Is it the corporate polluters? No, that's an externality them pushing their cost of doing business onto us. Emerald ash borer is something that we have heard far too frequently about here in Eau Claire. It threatens to ruin our trees, it threatens our property values. Who's paying to cut those trees down and replace them? That's an externality. Is it the corporate polluters creating climate change causing that emerald ash borer to expand? Are they paying that? No, we're paying. So we've heard from folks in the audience, and I'm sure we'll hear from other county board members who will talk about the human and the moral interests of this. But I also wanted to point out the capitalist perspective. So vote for the environment, but also vote for capitalism. Stop allowing certain private companies to continue there to push their cost of doing business onto us all. We shouldn't have to pay for their bills, and the fee for dividend is the most capitalist way to do it. Thank you. Thank you. Supervisor Neiman. 
I want to speak in favor of this resolution. The state of our environment is the most critical issue of our time because all life arises from and depends on it. The health of the environment, our economy, and our people are inextricably linked. The information provided in our packet has given ample evidence of the benefit of the carbon fee and dividend support for it is growing in Congress thanks to the ongoing efforts of citizens and legislators on both sides of the aisle. Congress needs to hear our voice urging them to act on a national and global level. The future of our children and grandchildren in our world depends on it. Thank you. Thank you. I see no other indications of a wish to speak. Uh, at this point we will vote on this item. This is file number 19, recognizing climate change and urging Congress to levy a revenue neutral fee on carbon and fossil fuels. Just as a reminder to you, the resolution is directing to send a copy of the resolution to the Governor of Wisconsin, Assembly members and Senators representing Eau Claire County, Senator Ron Johnson, Senator Tammy Baldwin, Representative Ron Kind, and the Wisconsin Counties Association. Please take your key pads to hand and vote. Oh, that was quick, thank you. We have 26 <laughs> yes and two no. The resolution does pass. Uh, just a reminder to you, the next item on our agenda has been moved from its position. This is file number 39. Requesting the state legislature to explore all solutions, including legislation to address the long-term care workforce crisis. Uh, before we have motion and second on this, I just want to point out to you that this was moved prior to file 25 because this would go to the Wisconsin Counties Association as one of the uh, resolutions that we would like to uh, in, uh, have the association include in its list. So, uh, motion please. Motion by Supervisor Miller, second by Supervisor Lavelle. Um, sorry. Um, uh, comment by, uh, or explanation by Supervisor Bates. Thank you, Mr. Chair. There's no question of what's happening <coughs> in our region and the state of Wisconsin in regards to need for individuals that can work in our long-term care facilities. We have had the closing of a number of nursing homes and actually some of the particular areas within the homes have been closed primarily because of the lack of personnel. So no matter what area we're talking about in this particular part of, of care, there is a real need to be able to increase the number of individuals that are available to be able to serve the clients. I don't think there's any question that there are things that can be done. Uh, whether it happens to be the reduction of tuition, more student loans, moving some programs in at high school level, and a lot of other areas that could be assisting in making sure these jobs are filled. And hopefully by individuals that, that uh, perhaps even can upgrade their skills in order that they receive a better pay for what they're doing. So I would re encourage your support of this particular resolution. Thank you. Supervisor Crunk. Um, I was actually going to speak on the, the resolution we just passed, but it's good because it passed. <laughs> so I'm okay with that. Does that um, mean I, I'm slow and no, 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 okay. no, I didn't say that. Um, I do support this resolution, though, too, having been a nurse for quite a long time, um, having been a CNA prior myself, and also experiencing um, a father who we tried to keep home and on hospice, really home for as long as we could. And it is a struggle, not just for my family, but many families to find good and affordable care to come into the home when you have to privately pay. So I do support this resolution. Thank you. Thank you. Supervisor Stelches. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I support this as well. It kind of, uh, I think, rings to what Supervisor Buchanan was saying before about free market, and uh, which I fully support. There, there's, there's something going wrong in our system of, of long-term 
you know, healthcare that for some reason uh, we don't value that service enough to where we're paying people enough where people are flocking in to become a home health care worker. I mean, that's the bottom line. And I guess as a society, we just don't value that service enough to drive the wage up. And that was one of the things I think we were trying to touch upon with the living wage uh, and acting locally. But I think uh, trying to act more, uh, at least statewide here, is a very admirable thing. And uh, perhaps this is uh, one of those areas where the market economy has not served people well and government has a role to uh, try to help, so I support it. Thank you. I see no other indications of a desire to speak. Therefore, please take your keypads in hand and vote on the file number 39, requesting the state legislature to explore all solutions, including legislation, to address the long-term care workforce crisis. I remind you that this is a resolution that we're adding to the Wisconsin Counties Association list. Please vote. Mm -hmm. All right. Are you okay? Mm -hmm. He's gone, so. All right. That passes 27 to nothing. It is unanimous. Thank you. The next item on our agenda is file number 25. Requesting resolutions to be considered at the 2018 WCA annual business meeting. Motion by Supervisor Leary, second by Supervisor Wilkie. Uh, uh, explanation by um, Corporation Council's Ames. Um, Oops, sorry. <laughs> sure it is. <laughs> So uh, every, every year uh, during the year, the county board adopts certain resolutions that recommend that legislation be passed by uh, the state legislature taking uh, positions on bills that are pending before the state legislature. Um, some of those are acted upon uh, by the state legislature. And what we do then um, about this time every year, because these things have to be submitted to the uh, counties association by June 25th to June 26th, is we go through all of those, uh, check which ones have been acted on, which ones haven't, and then put that list together, and then that uh, comes to before the board for your consideration as to whether you want to pass these to the counties association for them to look at from a legislative standpoint in their annual meeting in September and take positions on those. So these are all things that have been passed, and there's an amendment number one that uh, actually addresses the resolution that you just passed. Um, so basically what you're, you're okay. reinforcing what the board has already done over the past year uh, to send it specifically to WCA so that they will put it on their legislative agenda and consider it. Uh, I understand at this point that we have to have an amendment to the resolution, is that correct? An amendment to, to add, the resolution. To right? add. Amendment one, do you want to speak to that? We need, okay, we need well, so, so amendment one is, is resolution, resolution that you uh, that you just uh, adopted, and that's why so the, to move the, the order was switched in your agenda. So, I'm sorry about this. <laughs> we need to have someone move the amendment that, that Keith just described. It. Supervisor Bates is making the motion. Thank you. I would, I would Supervisor, move sorry. I would move the amendment. Thank you, Supervisor Miller. Second. We've had the explanation already. Is there anything you wish to add? An explanation? Okay. okay. Now you want to vote on the amendment? Yes, we're, we will now vote on the amendment. Okay, please take your keypads. You're voting on the amendment, not the main motion. We are now back to the main motion. Is there any further discussion of the main motion? <laughs> Some clear indications that we don't have any wish to, to discuss that. Please take your keypads in hand and, and vote on the main motion. Are you 
repeat. It's the uh, four resolutions that will be considered at the 2018 WCA annual business meeting. Please vote. Thank you. Oh, sorry. Supervisor Dunning. Does this include the motion on the climate change? Yes, it does. I think. No, it does not. No, it does not. That's not, a, that's not a state issue or a state. Oh, sorry. That's, that's, that's going to the federal Congress. the federal government. So it's not in the WCA. And the cross so, so. is going to the WCA. Sorry? The cross is in resolution is going to the WCA. Well, all I can say is a right for the cross. <laughs> It doesn't say that in ours. Well, so. it says it in the, uh, be it for the result, it goes to the Wisconsin yeah. Counties well, Association. I think, can I? So it yeah. will go to the Wisconsin Counties Association. What this specific resolution does is mm -hmm. ask that the resolutions that are c contained therein be specifically put on the legislative agenda for the Legislative Committee for WCA. So it'll still go there. To the WCA and they'll get it, but it, it's not going as a state issue that's that's included in this resolution. Supervisor Buchanan. Um, if, if it would be in order, could we move to amend to include the climate change resolution to um, go to the policy body? And if so, I would like to make that motion. Uh, let me check first. So we're amending that motion. Right? Oh, oh, so I, I guess what this would be is actually an amendment number two. Okay. Okay. So we have amendment number two. Will you restate the amendment, please? Um, the, the amendment would simply be to um, also include the climate change resolution that we passed um, as. Are going to um, for policy consideration. Okay, we have an amendment. Is there a second? Second, second from Supervisor Neiman. Is there any discussion of that amendment? Um, Supervisor Bates. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm wondering whether or not it might be appropriate if you're sending it to the WCA to add the verbiage, verbiage that it become part of what we take to NACL. The National Counties Association. Okay. That would be an amendment to the amendment. <laughs> could we, could we uh, simply editorialize it? This chair does not accept friendly amendments <laughs> under Robert's rules. <laughs> this chair is hard about that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Seriously. So, uh, Keith, we, we've done okay, I think if it goes to WCA, they have to decide what they want to do with it, and clearly it's it's a national issue. And I think, as I understand their legislative process, that committee meets and then it goes to the annual meeting in, in um, September, and then people vote on uh, the recommendations that have been made. And I don't know what the form of that recommendation could be, but I would assume that it would include going to NACL because it's not an, an issue that WCA itself controls. So what would you say about this amendment? I, I, I think it could be made. I don't think it's necessary. I think that's what the WCA legislative process is. Okay. We, you made the, the uh, amendment to because, the amendment. Because let, 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 me, let me say this. I think, it's, I think it's out of order in the sense that you've you already adopted. It really would have been uh, in order when you were considering that resolution itself uh, and it was not made at that time. At this time you can't amend that resolution through a separate resolution. What you can that's do is correct. send it to WCA. So yeah, That's correct. So I'm going to rule your amendment to the amendment out of order and we are now at the point of that first amendment. I believe we have to vote on that. Is that correct? We well, it's amendment number two. Amendment, amendment number, number two. two. Yeah. Right. I'm sorry. Amendment and I did cancel your votes because you were voting on the the or the, the resolution I, on the what's going to the WCA. Now with this amendment, I canceled your vote, so you, the vote now will be for amendment number two. Okay. Which is adding file number 19 to the list that is going to the WCA. Okay. So we are voting just on that amendment. Amendment two. 
Please take your keypads and vote. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Oops. Just a minute here. I think. That was confusing. Mm -hmm. Sorry about that. <laughs> That passes 26 to 2. We are now back to the main motion. Right, thank you. Yep. We are back to the main motion, which I'm going to ask the clerk to restate as amended. We're Sorry. requesting resolutions to be considered at the 2018 WC annual business meeting. There was three in your agenda packet. Uh, you are now adding, because of the two amendments, you're adding file number 19, which is recognizing climate change and urging Congress to levy a revenue neutral fee on carbon fossil fuels, and also requesting the state, excuse me, file number 39, requesting the state legislature to explore all solutions, including legislation to address the long term care workforce crisis. So you are voting on the amended main motion. Which will end up to be five resolutions going for the WCA business meeting. Thank you. Please take your keypads and vote. Just a second here. That passes 26 to 2. Thank you very much. The next item on our agenda is file 26. Authorizing return of community development block grant funds to the state of Wisconsin. Motion. Motion by Supervisor Jansen, second by Supervisor Gordon, explanation by uh, Administrator Shaw. Thank you. The Community Development Block Grant Program actually has a number of different programs. The specific monies that you are referencing this evening are economic development dollars that can only be used to create a revolving loan fund program. Currently, the West Central Wisconsin Regional Planning Commission operates a revolving loan fund on behalf of the region. That loan fund is defederalized. What that means is that there are a number of restrictions that do not apply to the West Central Wisconsin's regional loan fund. And so if the county were to attempt to create its own revolving loan fund, we would be in direct competition with the West Central Wisconsin Regional Fund's loan program. And for a business, it makes more sense for them to take the money from West Central because it does not have all of the restrictions. Along with that, the state is currently proposing that any local level revolving loan fund programs that are currently operated by a single municipality be closed. And so there are a number of communities throughout the state of Wisconsin that they are proposing the closure of that program. And the reason for that is that the federal dollars are restricted and can only be used for job creation. Currently, with the full employment that the state of Wisconsin is experiencing, most businesses are not creating new positions. They are looking for quality and talented workforce. And so what the state is proposing to do is to re absorb those monies because there are multi-millions of dollars within the loan funds throughout the state of Wisconsin. By taking that money back, they can then reallocate it into other community development block grant programs, such as housing, public facilities. One of the things that's being proposed within the change is that communities that are returning this money would actually be able to dollar for dollar reapply for those funds under a different program heading for an identified need within the community. Therefore, the recommendation of the committee was to return the funds because at this point, the likelihood of even having a program, a new program approved by the state is really non-existent. Thank you. Supervisor Buchanan. I don't think he wants oh. to talk. Sorry. Oh, never mind. Mm -hmm. Supervisor DeLuca. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, just one question. Um, no chance we can take the CDBG funds and roll them over into the Chippewa Valley Innovation Center? No, we cannot. The only option that we have is either to return them to the state of Wisconsin or actually create our own revolving loan fund. All right, thank you. Thank you. I see no other indications of a desire to speak, so please take your keypads and you are voting on file number 26. Authorizing the returning of community development block grant funds to the state of Wisconsin. Please vote. That passes 27 to 1. Thank you very much. The next item on our agenda is file number 27. Recognizing the Eau Claire City County Health Department for National Public Health Accreditation. Okay. Um, motion by Supervisor Kronk, second by Supervisor Wilkie. Um, I'm not sure who I'm calling on here. I know that Courtney Draxler is here from the... Wilkie, actually. Uh, Wilkie. Wilkie actually put it forth. I'm sorry, Supervisor Wilkie. But I'm sure we're going to be asking Ms. Draxler to come forward. Yes. With apologies, Supervisor Wilkie. That's exactly what I'm going to do in a couple of minutes. Here. Okay. Ask the, the permission of the chair to have Courtney staff from the City County Health Department take up just a few of your minutes to share with you. But the resolution that's before you this evening is for your vote for you to have an opportunity to express your pride and your appreciation for what these Eau Claire City County Health Department staff have accomplished. This is really a big deal. It's a hard, hard process to achieve this accreditation. So it's an opportunity for you to go on record once we vote on the resolution of, uh, of your appreciation for their work as well as I hope that you have an opportunity to speak directly to any of the uh, health department staff <coughs> that you express your appreciation. With that, Mr. D Chair, I would appreciate if uh, Courtney Draxler uh, from the City County Health Department could take a couple minutes of the county's time to tell us briefly why this was done and what it is. Uh, we will do that. Just for the for clarification, the chair doesn't give permission. When the chair says without objection, you are giving the permission. <laughs> so without objection, we'll ask Ms. Draxler to come forward. Hi, I'm Courtney Draxler. I'm the accreditation coordinator and the policy and systems division manager for the health department. I first wanted to start off by saying thank you for this recognition of the health department and all the work done to, for us to achieve national accreditation and thank the board for their 75 years of partnership with the city council to support our unique partnership um, or unique structure as a city county health department. Um, we're very excited and proud to be an accredited health department. This truly has been a department-wide effort and we have a few key members of our health department team in the back row if they can stand so you can see them they're hiding back there. <laughs> would you would you introduce them? Um, sure. So Marissa is our uh, assistant director of the health department. Um, Tegan is our manager of internal operations, and Beth is our division manager for Healthy Beginnings. Thank you. And they're just a few of the the key partner or key staff members throughout um, this accreditation process. And so we didn't reach this process overnight. This has truly been a few, few years in the making. Um, and now that we're accredited, it doesn't mean that our work is done. Quarter accreditation is our work with community partners, our commitment to quality improvement, um, and our willingness to tackle tough public health issues. Uh, accreditation is really an ongoing process to achieve and maintain these national standards of excellence. And so we've started working on this when accreditation became an option for the health department and that was in 2013. So really working on some of the core documents, which is having a strategic plan, having completing a community health assessment, so looking at the needs in our community, and then creating a community health improvement plan for what are we gonna do about those top identified needs. Um, having quality improvement be really core to our work, so continuously looking at how are we meeting what we want to do as a health department, and building that into our structure, as well as building in performance measurement and performance management 
into our core um, operations as a health department. And that was kind of our base for our work, but then really building into the tenants essential public health services um, and working on that for the last three years. And we'll continue working on that and continue to improve over the next how many years that we strive to be an accredited health department. Um, I know that Lisa, our health, health officer, was unable to be here tonight, but her leadership, as well as the leadership and support of our Board of Health, was really key to this accreditation process. And really want to acknowledge our, our thanks as staff for that. Thank you. Is there any supervisor who wishes to offer comment? Thank you, Mr. Axler. Please take your keypads and vote on file number 27. Recognize the Eau Claire City County Health Department for National Public Health Accreditation. <coughs> That vote is unanimous. Thank you very much. The next item on our agenda is file number uh, 36. Uh, there is an editorial correction here, if you don't mind. The date of the November election is actually November 6th. In the resolution, it says November 3rd. So uh, if it's OK with everyone, we're going to change that date to be the correct one. Direct <laughs> directing the county clerk to place the referendum question contained in this resolution regarding creation of a nonpartisan procedure for the preparation of legislative and congressional redistricting plans on the November 6, 2018 ballot. Uh, motion, Supervisor Kronk, second, Supervisor Maury. Explanation, Supervisor Maury. Oh, I'm sorry, it'd help if I turned on the microphone. It should be. Mm -hmm. Do it again. Do it again if he touched it. There. No. Okay. <laughs> Don't touch it again. <laughs> um, this this uh, is a, an effort to try and put before the voters uh, the ability to speak out on this issue. I think 39 counties today have actually uh, adopted resolutions encouraging the uh, creation of a nonpartisan procedure for preparation of legislative and congressional redistricting plans. Um, Iowa, for example, has three public hearings. A nonpartisan commission comes up with a plan they, they share with the public, and then the legislature votes on it. And that's worked really well for them. Um, Wisconsin, on the other hand, the uh, party in control disappears into a secret uh, uh, place with computers and lawyers and uh, uh, there's no transparency, and the plans, uh, as uh, many people uh, have a perspective that they are partisan in nature, and they take away um, your ability to be counted as a voter. Um, I think we really need fair, transparent, and competitive elections, and uh, this would just be another way for the voters to have a voice in, in uh, letting the legislature know that something should be done about this. Uh, Supervisor McKinney, you canceled your wish to speak. I would, that was to address the last issue. Okay. Uh, Supervisor Wilkie. I hope that um, our representatives will listen to the voice of the public. The purpose of this, as I see it, is getting the public to vote. And I would hope that the public out there will give a very strong rep message to our representatives that we're tired of their having the ability to pick the voters. The voters should be picking them. Uh, now, both parties have been guilty of this over the years, and it really needs to stop. I hope with the public, as I expect, will turn out and give a strong message to those candidates that are running for office that they, they have to change this. It's got to be done in a way that's fair and not political motivations to how they draw the uh, uh, districts. Uh, we as a body already have sent a resolution. Uh, unfortunately, I think it kind of fell on deaf ears. Um, I think the people voting, it might increase the probability that they'll listen, as well as I would hope that it would become part of their campaigns, whatever party and they would speak to the issue if they think that uh, boundaries should be drawn in a fair and impartial way or should be done in a political way 
for an advantage of the, par the party that happens to be in control. Um, I, I encourage your support and let's get this on the ballot. Maybe having the public speak, uh, uh, they'll listen to, even if they weren't listening to us. Thank you. Supervisor Buchanan. Thank you. One of the very fundamental natures of a democratic republic is the idea of one person is one for one vote, and that voters get to pick their representatives and not the other way around. We've heard many times um, in the news all across this nation how Wisconsin is one of the, the most gerrymandered state in the entire country. Um, just to give one slight example, we have one political party in 2012 that a majority of Wisconsin voters voted to have their representatives be of that party in the state assembly, and yet the other party got over 60% of the seats. Less than 50% of the vote, more than 60% of the representation. I know that some people in one particular party like that arrangement if they get to have all that power, but that is fundamentally undemocratic and we all as Americans should be disgusted by that and have and say that that is wrong. That's why I'm strongly supporting this because I believe fundamentally if you want to have a bit of civility back in state and national politics, you do it by having state seats that are not so hyper gerrymandered they only send the most extremes to their representatives. Um, to Congress. So I just urge you to vote yes and think about why we need to vote yes and, and what the fundamental nature of democracy is. And that's that we get to pick our vote, our representatives. Thank you. Supervisor Gatlin. Thank you, Chair. I just wanted to add that like the system they use in Iowa, it costs a lot less money for the state when you have this nonpartisan system in place. They literally get the board and they go in a van and go look at the outlines and where they should draw the lines. Spending a lot less money than the way that we're doing it right now in the state of Wisconsin. Thank you. Thank you. I see no other indication of a desire to speak. Therefore, please take your keypads. You are voting on uh, file number 36. Which is to place a referenda question on the November 6th ballot regarding nonpartisan procedure uh, for <clears throat> legislative and congressional redistricting plans. Please vote. Well, that was quick. <laughs> it is unanimous uh, 28 to 0. Thank you very much. The next item on our agenda comes from the Committee on Highway. Uh, it's file 41. Establishing a desired average highway condition rating. Motion, Supervisor Leary. Second, Supervisor Chilson. Explanation, Supervisor Henning. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> Maintaining our highway system is vital to the economic growth and development of Oakland County, as well as providing access to employment, social health, and educational services. <clears throat> Having a highway system con system condition rating of six for an overall pace of condition and provide an average to good condition for the highway trunk system. For those who don't understand the pace of rating, it goes from one to ten, then ten being the goals would be perfect. Um, and uh, <clears throat> if we can maintain our roads at a 6.2 um, uh, level, we're going to be sustainable for a long, long time. And so the, the cost of construction requires an annual operation funding level of $5.1 million for highway maintenance, capital funding of $6.25 million for highway improvements, for total investment need of $11.35 million and where necessary funding levels will vary and keep the six due to varying costs of commodities, inflation, and technology advancements. Um, it is now resolved that the Oak Clare County Board of Supervisors hereby sets a desired overall pavement condition rating for a county trunk highway system at a PASER rating of six. Thank you. 
I see no, well, I'm sorry, Supervisor Miller. Yes, I just, uh, I think I want a little bit of clarification on the fact sheet very near the bottom. It says fiscal impact, 1.35 million, <coughs> in addition to existing funding annually to a, obtain this 6.0 PACER. Are we saying by adopting this goal of PACER 6, we are also agreeing to add that extra one point million to the budget, or is that just what the potential addition would be to the budget to reach that six? Uh, I don't think I'm qualified to answer that. Our, our uh, highway commissioner was going to give this report, and I didn't know he wasn't coming till the last minute, so I didn't bring anything with me. So. Uh, okay. Thank you. Supervisor Chilson. Thank you. <coughs> I, I think I can answer that. Um, in the Highway <coughs> Committee, we uh, have had a lot of discussion about the desired PACER rating and what the optimal uh, road condition level that we feel as a committee or we feel that maybe the county should pursue. Uh, in those conversations, from where we're at today with a 5.4 rating, uh, to get our rating moved to a six, in our conversation with John Johnson, Highway Commissioner, the numbers that were proposed with the funding levels that we need and the construction that can be done at those levels, his feeling was a level of $6.25 million would be the amount needed to move the needle and get us eventually to a 6.0 number. Now, this resolution is saying that our goal and our desired PACER rating is a six. At this point, it is not saying that it's inclusive to get to the six, we're then allocating another 1.3. We're saying the desired outcome for us to get to where we wanna be is a six, and to achieve that would be $6.25 million, which would be a $1.3 million increase from where we are currently at if that answers the question. So six is where we want to go. 6.25 gets us there and keeps us there at some point. It's, it, it wouldn't be if we authorize 6.25 for next year, great, we get it, and we're all of a sudden going to be at a six because that's not, that's not the deal. But long-term projected to get to six requires 6.25-ish. Thank you. Thank you. Let's have an answer to your question, Supervisor Miller. Uh, yeah, basically, I guess I, at this point, I might even question why we needed a resolution to that effect. I think it's a lofty goal, and I think that's something wonderful that the committee could be working towards in the department. But, but if, if we're not tying our hands one way or the other with uh, finances, I, I, I'm kind of like, well, okay. I guess I'd like to just respond to that as well. The, the sheet tonight says that it came out of the Committee on Highway, which is true. Uh, but this concept in the resolution itself was developed with the conjunction of the Highway and the Finance and Budget Committee together after approximately a two and a half hour meeting, lots of discussions of where we are PACER rating wise, where are we at financially? And actually, the idea of the six as the goal came out of the conversation between finance and budget and highway from actually with Supervisor Pagonis. And the resolution then took root and, and moved forward. But it is a highway committee resolution, and, and that's where it came from. I'm sorry, but Supervisor Chilson, Supervisor Pergonis is establishing a little side entertainment over there. <laughs> before I go, before I will call on you. <laughs> sorry, the next uh, speaker in line is uh, Supervisor Stelges, and then. Thank you, Chairman. Um, so I, I guess based on what Supervisor Chilson just said, I would have to assume six resulted in some sort of compromise between attention between 
finance and highway, it seems kind of low actually. No, no, no? no compromise. Okay, well that's good. Uh, the other question was, is there, could anybody say what the state average or regional average is in pace for rating? Can, does someone have an answer to that? No. Supervisor Pergonis, are you volunteering an answer to that? No, but we just got a book that has things yes. by yeah. uh, the Green Book. County. It's going to be anywhere as far as being highway expenditures is on page 22. I'm sorry, was that an answer to the question or just a referral to the resource? Well, I guess there, I guess we don't know. We don't know. Okay. We'll take that as, a, as an answer. Uh, Supervisor Anton. With regard to this, this establishment of a specific number, uh, at the time that we met with the, I'm on the uh, Highway Commission, the time we met with the Finance Committee, uh, John Johnson said, the number that we are talking about now, six, is the least cost number that we should pursue. If we pursue an eight or nine, we're putting our roads at a higher level than they need to be for the traffic that we handle. If we put them at a four or five or something less, in the longer term, it costs us more money than if we put it at a six. It's kind of like changing the oil on the automobile rather than changing the engine in the automobile if you ignore the oil. If we don't maintain our roads at a six, and that's you know, an understandably a somewhat big number, but, uh, but historically it's been well established uh, within the state as I understand it. Uh, if we don't do it at six, we're going to spend more money in the longer term because then we have to do bigger highway projects in order to recover from the loss because we didn't properly maintain them when they were at a higher level of uh, maintenance in years past. So this is not really an arbitrary number at all. It was established uh, as a least cost, most economical uh, aim point. And that was the point that uh, John made at our meeting. And if he were here, I'm sure he would uh, repeat that comment. And I'm just, repeat, I'm just saying it in his absence. Thank it's you. An important number. Uh, Supervisor Pergomis, I believe I cut you off, sorry. Um, no, you didn't cut me off, I don't think you just called on me, but that's fine. <laughs> um, so, yes, this was a joint resolution between Highway and the and, and Finance Committee, and um, when we discussed it, we were actually discussing that we were looking at an average of six, so it's not as though the minimum level is necessarily six for every road, but we're looking at an average of six. The irony for this is the higher the PACER rating, the greater the general transportation aids. It seems counterintuitive to me, but that has been the practice. So by getting our roads to a six level, then we could, we ex would expect to see um, additional transportation aids. Um, right now for, um, for the highway department, overall capital spending is right about nine million, and so we're a little bit short of the eleven million that is mentioned in here. But um, uh, you know, we're this commitment to get to a six, and as Supervisor Chilson says, we're not going to do it in one year. But to get us from where we are now to the six would require the infusion of at least another um, 1300 That may or may not occur all in the time. Uh, Thank you. Uh, comment from uh, Administrator mm -hmm. Um Just so that board members know, there are a number of reference points that are on the website. I will resend board members the link because there is a comparison of the 11 counties surrounding Eau Claire mm -hmm. County in their PACER ratings. And there's also a chart in there that shows the um, information on that PACER rating. So if you want to dive into that a little deeper into the detail, you may do so. Thank you. Supervisor Gatlin. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Actually, I was going to say what Supervisor Anton was saying on the rating. And to maintain it, we would spend more if we don't get them up to a six at this point. 
Thank you. Supervisor Beckfield. You know, this topic has been dogging us for years. And uh, I remember, but for the information of the new members here, uh, we were second to the bottom five years ago for the roads in any county in the state of Wisconsin. Am I accurate on that? That's correct. Mm -hmm. And we moved, one year we voted in an additional $5 million, if I remember, if we all remember correctly, <laughs> to put the money in there. And we have moved up a couple of notches. But I can tell you, if you've not taken a road tour of uh, Eau Claire County, you should ask John Johnson to show you some of the things. And I'm, he gave me a bridge to go look at the other day. And, you know, you hope that when you drive over that bridge and it's raining out, it's still there. Uh, but seriously, this is a problem that's not going to be easily fixed. It's a, it's a big commitment from everyone in Eau Claire. It's going to be a very difficult way of figuring out how to get there uh, because um, right now the monies aren't there. That's the way I understand it. So uh, I wanted to add that note, especially for our new members, because when you're second to last for the roads in your state, you got to pay a little attention to what's going on. So we need to do an investment somehow. Have a nice bike ride out there. Even. <laughs> Just as a point of clarity, we're no longer sitting at second from the bottom. No, we moved no. up a little. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, I see no other <coughs> indications of a wish to speak. Uh, Supervisors, please take your keypads in hand. We are voting on file number 41. Which is establishing a desired average highway condition rating of six. That passes 28 to nothing, it is unanimous. Yes, thank you very much. The next item on our agenda, the next item has come from Committee on Finance and Budget, file number 16. Amending section 2.12.140B of the code, medical examiner system. Motion. Motion. Supervisor Dunning, second Supervisor Crock. Explanation, Supervisor Pagonis. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. I asked them to have this um, referred to finance. Um, the old timers would recall that um, the um, we had our own medical examiner. We had an Eau Claire County medical examiner, and I wanted to. He, you don't have him any longer. He's not no longer a medical examiner, but I wanted to compare the cost of. Uh, having a contractor in that county with the possibility of having our own she can't individual okay. or, or group of individuals. And I also had some questions regarding the numbers that are, that are in the fact sheet that, that were unclear to me. Um, so I did review them, and um, the the costs actually commensurate. Um, I guess it appears as though Dunn County has a greater number of, of They do, they sign death certificates, they have inspections, they do look at, at, at different deaths. They have a greater number in Eau Claire County than they do in Dunn County. And so um, given the information that I was able to, to acquire, um, this, um, the uh, Committee on Finance and Budget uh, just moved to approve the uh, resolution as it's presented, it's an ordinance as presented. Are there any questions? Is there any discussion of this item? I see no indications. Supervisors, please take your keypads and vote on uh, file number 16. Amending section 2.12.140B of the code, medical examiner system. That item passes unanimously, 28 to nothing. Thank you. The next item on our agenda is 528. Authorizing the sale of tax deed property to the City of Altoona for $13,830.72, directing Corporation Council and the County Clerk to execute this said quick claim deed. Motion. Motion by Supervisor Henning, second by Supervisor Lavelle. Uh, explanation, Supervisor Pagonis. Um, yes, this is uh, identical to what we did last month where a, um, a, a municipality has asked to purchase back 
the um, a, a parcel that has gone on tax deed sale. Um, in this particular one, the county will realize um, all of the uh, all of the different the the, uh, the specials and the delinquent taxes, and so the county will break out even on this. Thank you. I see no indications of a desire to address this. Supervisors, please take your keypads and vote on file number 28. And this is to sell a tax deed property to the city of Altoona. That passes unanimously, 28 to nothing. Thank you, file number 31. Awarding a bids for the spring 2018 tax deed sale uh, property and there was two properties that were sold and they went to the highest bidder and directing corporation counsel and the county clerk to execute said quick claim deed. Motion. Supervisor Leary, second. Supervisor DeLuca. Uh, explanation, Supervisor Pergonis. We're going to keep you very busy here. Okay, thank you. <laughs> um, these are all very short. Um, so each year, um, the county, um, when there are properties that are available for tax deed um, and that have not been sold up to this point, they put them in for a spring bid. Um, this year, coincidentally, the same individual bid on both was the highest bid on the two. Uh, my recollection is that both of them are empty lots. The houses have been torn down on both. So the county will take a loss on this but um, it will get I see no indications of a desire to address this. Supervisors, please take your keypads and vote on file number 31. Which is the sale of two properties in the 2018 tax deed sale. Supervisor Gibson. Thank you. That item passes 28 to nothing, unanimous. Thank you very much. The next item on our agenda is file number 32. Appropriating unanticipated revenues and authorizing 2017 department revenue and expenditure budget increases due to grants awarded in 2017. Motion. Supervisor Cronk. Second, Supervisor Jansen. Explanation, Supervisor Pagones. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, this is actually somewhat mistitled. They were not unanticipated revenue. What these are were grants that were applied for by these different departments. The grants came in um, after after the uh, budget period was closed, and so um, and I believe that the funding was actually spent during the year. So it's just coming it's coming in. They anticipated it being awarded. So they were not unanticipated revenues, but um, that's just how it got phrased. So you're informing us that we don't have extra money. <laughs> it's right. No, I'm sorry. Right. That's what it is. These it's were it's grants that were planned and the money was spent. So we're breaking out even. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Supervisor Gatlin, I think. Thank you. So is this basically so the accounting people can adjust the books and balance your assets and liabilities. Can you hear the question? I, I could. I did hear the question. Um, in a way, so during the year, the grants were applied for and the money's received. And during 2017, the money was spent and it just came in. So it's just acknowledging that the grants funding came in. So yes, it's adjusting the revenue. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. I see no other indications of a wish to speak. Supervisors, please take your keypads and vote on file 32. Which is authorizing 2017 department revenue and expenditure budget increases due to grants awarded in 2017. Supervisor Chilson. Thank you. That passes unanimously, 28 to nothing. Thank you. Our final item is file number 38. No, it's not. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. <laughs> 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 
authorizing yeah, pay we authorizing there. payment of vouchers over ten thousand issued during the month of May two thousand eighteen. Uh, motion. Supervisor Buchanan, second. Supervisor Beckfield. Any explanation or questions, <laughs> Supervisor Pergonis? Are there any questions? Thank you very much. Please take your keypads and vote accordingly <laughs> on file number 38. Which is authorizing payments of vouchers over 10,000 issued during the month of May 2018. Supervisor Lavelle. Thank you. That passes unanimously, 28 to nothing. We are back now to the three files that are erroneously listed under number eight, beginning with file, uh, and this is also, this is planning and development. File number 15. Amending the 1982 official zoning district boundary map for the town of Washington. Motion. Supervisor Chilson. Second, Supervisor Lavelle. Um, explanation. And supervisor, oh, and supervisor uh, back up is uh, Rod Esling is there. I'm sorry, but the explanation was coming from Supervisor Gibson. Which one of you is doing Gibson. this? <laughs> supervisor Gibson, thank you. Okay, this is uh, to rezone 5.2 acres from R3 multifamily residents to district to a two agriculture resident district to allow development of a single family home. Uh, planning development recommended approval of this town washing board for approval and planning development for approval. So, approval. Okay, so we have a motion to approve. Further questions or discussion? I see none. Please take your keypads and vote on file number 15. Amending the official zoning district boundary map for the town of Washington. Supervisor Anton and Supervisor Coffey. Thank you. Uh, the vote is unanimous, 28 to nothing. Next item of item number 29. Amending the 1982 mm -hmm. official zoning district boundary map for the town of Draman. Motion. Supervisor Dunning, second Supervisor Leary. Which one of the two of you in the back is explaining this? Supervisor. Yes. I'm chair of the committee, so I would explain it, right? Well, ordinarily, yes. <laughs> At this point, I'm getting a little punchy, and I can't tell who's. Sorry. Who's the other person that you were talking about? Lavelle. <laughs> He's not on PND. I know, but they're colluding. Oh, oh. <laughs> they're colluding. <laughs> My apologies. I'm getting a little punchy. <laughs> <laughs> right. Supervisor Gibson, moving right along. All right. This is a rezoning position to rezone 25.75 acres from AP Agriculture Preservation of District 83 to allow construction of a single family resident. Um, this was recommended approval by Planning and Development Department. Um, Town and Dramon voted for approval and the uh, Committee on Planning and Development voted for approval, recommended. So I would recommend approval. Thank you. Um, I, are there any comments or questions from the, from the members? Okay, please take your keypads in hand and vote on file number 29. Which is amending the official zoning district boundary map for the town of Draman. Supervisor Knight. Thank you, that passes 20 to nothing unanimously. Now truly the last item on our agenda is file number 30. Amending the 1982 official zoning district. What? That family was waiting for that. Oh. <laughs> they said only for. Oh, well. <laughs> Sorry to keep them awake so long. <laughs> File number 30 is amending the 1982 official zoning district bounty map for the town of Pleasant Valley. Motion. Supervisor Anderson, welcome to the voting group. <laughs> Supervisor Chilson is second. Explanation, Supervisor Gibson. Okay, this is to rezone five acres land from rural homes district to A2 agriculture to allow future construction of accessory structures in excess of 1,200 square feet. 
which is permitted in the RH district. Um, Town of Pleasant Valley is recommend approval, uh, planning development department recommends approval, and the committee in planning development voted for approval. So I would recommend that we approve it also. Thank you. I see no indication of a desire to speak to this. So supervisors, please take your keypads and vote on file 30. Which is amending the official zoning district bounty map for the town of Pleasant Valley. Uh, that is accepted 27 to 1. Thank you very much. We have reached the end of our agenda. We are adjourned. Thank you for your great patience this evening. This program was brought to you by a cooperation between NewsWorks and Eau Claire County. NewsWorks is made possible by continuing community support. If you would like to volunteer or make a donation, please contact us via phone at 715-839-5067 or online at valleymediaworks.org.